Welcome, Age of Vintage Society. Margaret Sullivan's life was marked by tragedy, but there was one person in her life who truly loved her. There were no hidden agendas or deceptive tactics. All their lives there were only two people who genuinely cared for one another. However, they were never quite in the same place at the same time. Yes, it was love, but not the conventional one. Why even powerful men feared from Margaret Sullivan? Make sure to watch the video until the end and leave your thoughts in the comments. If you are new here, join our wonderful community by subscribing to the Age of Vintage channel. You might have heard countless stories of Hollywood starlets who struggle to cope with the demands and struggles of stardom. We have seen actresses who felt deceived by the dominance of the Hollywood studio system. Then there are the glamorous Hollywood stars who appeared to be cursed in love or who expressed distress at being parted from the person they genuinely wanted. In Margaret Sullivan, all three of these tragic individuals were present. In this video, we will look at every aspect of her life, including the reality of her unpredictable relationship with James Stewart. The daughter of a rich stockbroker, Margaret was born in Norfolk, Virginia in 1909, but until the age of six she was unable to walk due to a childhood illness. She stunned her class-conscious parents when she was finally able to move around independently by choosing to join in the rough and tumble of the youngsters from the wrong part of town, instead of more polite pursuits. She received a private education from her parents at Chatham Episcopal Institute, where she was also voted as the school's student body president. After Chatham, Margaret relocated to Boston to live with her half-sister and decided to pursue a career in acting. In an effort to control their disobedient daughter, her parents scandalously cut her money. However, she was never one to give up. She found work at the Harvard Cooperative Bookstore and persisted in her acting studies. Eventually, she received a part in the close-up play by the esteemed Harvard Dramatic Society in 1929, and boom! She performed it so well. Henry Fonda, a future Hollywood heartthrob, was one of her co-stars. In one of the scenes, she was meant to slap him. Margaret Sullivan, however, did nothing half-heartedly. So how can you expect a weak slap from her? Sullivan gave it her all every time she had to slap Fonda's character, whether it was during a rehearsal or the actual performance. Fonda later recalled that she gave him a rock-solid slap but young Fonda's response to this treatment was completely unexpected. He ultimately realised she fascinated him, instead of turning away. However, Fonda had strong competition. Yes, it was Jimmy Stewart, who was adorably awkward, yet incredibly attractive, and was Fonda's best buddy. Naturally, Sullivan joined their lively group, and the three quickly grew to be extremely close friends. In fact, Stewart began to develop feelings for the vivacious actress at the same time that Fonda did. Finally working up the guts, Stewart decided to go ahead and ask Sullivan out on a date. The offer to go on a date from Stewart, according to Sullivan, was the longest, slowest, shyest, yet most sincere she had ever received. But they were destined for a disappointing outcome. Sullivan rejected Stewart because of his reputation as a con man, but as we will see, there was always a sneaking suspicion of what might have been in their relationship. But Fonda quickly interfered. She accepted Fonda's marriage proposal, and on Christmas Day 1931 they were married. Even though they were already friends, Fonda and Sullivan didn't make the most of a match. Fonda was known for being cold and closed off, while Sullivan was the complete opposite. Sullivan and Fonda made every effort to make things work, even relocating to New York City together, to hunt for work. Despite their best efforts, they were only married for a mere two months before splitting up in early 1932. Then Sullivan's life truly began to pick up. Sullivan was one of Broadway's brightest stars by the 1930s. Sullivan's parents still disapproved of her aspirations well into her career, despite her success. But it wasn't until 1930 that they walked into a theatre and saw her acting prowess firsthand. They were in awe of what they saw. Even they had to acknowledge that their daughter was excellent, so they stopped bothering her. 
The same play that Sullivan's parents saw was seen by a scout for the powerful theatre partner Lee Schubert, who informed his boss that they had a star on their hands. Sullivan's first genuine opportunity to become famous came very close to being lost. She had a severe case of laryngitis when she met Schubert, and was concerned that her husky voice would put him off. That didn't actually happen, though. Of course, Schubert signed her on to perform in his plays, and guess what he liked the most in her? Her husky voice. Hollywood began to take note as expected, and John M. Stahl sought her out to star in his upcoming movie. The answer from Sullivan surprised him. She had already said nope to Paramount and Columbia and considered declining Stahl because she didn't want to surrender power to studios. Finally, the director offered her an offer she couldn't refuse, a multi-picture contract with a provision allowing her to come back and perform any time she preferred. Margaret's trip to Hollywood was unexpected. Industry insiders quickly recognised Sullivan as a girl who was difficult to handle or direct. She was fiercely independent and preferred to follow her own interests rather than have them imposed on her by powerful men. Even the head of the studio, Louis B. Mayer, one of the toughest and most powerful men in Hollywood, was afraid of the rebellious actress. Eddie Mannix, a Mayer assistant, admitted once that Sullivan was the only player who outbullied Mayer. Furthermore, he said, she gave him the level of frustration. In John Stahl's 1933 picture, Only Yesterday, Sullivan played her first ever movie role. It was supposed to be a time for her to celebrate her success, but instead it caused her embarrassment. Sullivan urged the studio to let her buy out her contract after seeing the rough cuts of her scenes. They replied, hell no, and Sullivan prepared herself for the worst. Sullivan was totally mistaken about only yesterday, even though she'd probably never confess it. The critics praised her work. Sullivan's next step was taken with all eyes on her. Sullivan saw various high points in her career, but she only had one favourite movie, the 1934 picture Little Man, What Now?, because the movie focuses on World War II hardship and unemployment. In 1935, she performed the role of a sweet orphan girl on the set of director William Wyler's film The Good Fairy. However, things were not all rosy in the background. Almost the whole shooting schedule saw Sullivan and the Wyler at odds with one another, in typical Sullivan style. Then, all of a sudden, their hatred flipped. Were they really in love? Probably not, but Sullivan grabbed this chance quickly since she was feisty, young and naive, eloping with Wyler in 1934, before The Good Fairy was even published. Even if it was Wyler's first and Sullivan's second marriage, it was still an absolutely terrible idea. Why? Just wait. Around this time, Sullivan began to convince some important studio doors in Hollywood to let her old friend Jimmy Stewart in. She wanted him in her upcoming movie, Next Time We Love, in particular since she had believed that he could become a famous actor ever since they met in the theatre. However, when she began pushing managers to hire her old friend, they didn't even know who he was. The turmoil then really began when Sullivan bet on Stewart and was now blamed for all of the studio's problems with him. Oh, they had lots of them. Stewart had only played in two movies by this point and their film's director, Edward Griffith, noticed this right away. He then started taunting both Stewart and Sullivan about it. Sullivan went into overdrive to make Stewart the main character because she was worried if she was going to embarrass herself. She spent a lot of time with him and enabled him to acquire the distinctive mannerisms and speech patterns we now associate with him. Later, Griffith himself had to confess that it was Margaret Sullivan who turned James Stewart into a star. But the quality time they spent together had a more serious impact. Sullivan and William Wyler were still legally married during the course of all this. One thing was clear despite Sullivan's mixed feelings. Stewart was deeply in love when they appeared in The Shop-Worn Angel in 1938. When he was with her, he was in his most vibrant form. A love like that can't remain silent for too long. The studio boss said after watching The Shop-Worn Angel, why they're red hot when they appear in front of a screen. Sullivan was, in other words, at the height of her powers. Everything eventually broke down. 
In 1936, after less than two years of marriage, she and William Waller split because she was unable to manage the failings of trust. Do you think that she rushed to Jimmy's arms? Uh, no. Instead, a few months after their divorce, she wed her agent, Leland Hayward. After the wedding, Sullivan duly moved in with Hayward, but there was one alarming sign. Can you guess it? She chose the house right across the street from her buddy Jimmy Stewart's home. Yes, this sounds confusing. We are just now starting to understand Jimmy Stewart and Margaret Sullivan. The most likely idea about their relationship holds that she resisted or ignored his approaches, while Stewart remained hopelessly in love with Sullivan. Sullivan's succession of weddings to partners other than Stewart were undoubtedly discouraging to him. The reality could, however, be very different. One of Tinseltown's biggest mysteries was revealed when Sullivan's daughter Brooke published a book about her mother in 1977. The book asserts that despite all their will-they-won't-they they pessimism, the love-stricken couple actually had an affair years ago while Sullivan was still married to Henry Fonda. However, they ended it when they realised it might damage their friendship, so they remained true friends for the rest of their lives. Sullivan and Hayward's union got off to a positive start. After being married, they soon had three kids, Bill, Bridget and Brooke. Sullivan appeared to be finally settling down for a calm life away from the camera for a little time. Then it ended in a tragic way. Sullivan experienced a wife's greatest nightmare in 1947 when she learned that her husband Leland was having an illicit affair with the stunning socialite Slim Keith. Sullivan didn't need to second-guess herself. She immediately filed for divorce, finally finalising the divorce in 1948. However, nothing was that easy. After the divorce, her family broke up. Everyone in the family absolutely hated the situation in which Sullivan stayed on the East Coast while Hayward travelled to California, and the kids were shuttled back and forth. To make matters worse, Hayward would frequently lavish the children with presents before sending them back to Sullivan, furious and frustrated with her dull life. All hell soon got loose. Sullivan, meanwhile, married Kenneth Wagg, a banker, for the fourth and final time. The actress found stability in the relationship for the first time in her life, despite the fact that it lacked the excitement of her previous relationships. Wagg supported her at her toughest times during more than ten years of marriage. Sullivan's kids gave her a devastating blow in 1955. Bridget and Bill both requested that they permanently move home with their happier father, and just visit Sullivan when they could make the time, because they were sick of travelling back and forth across the United States. Any mother would find this to be extremely painful to hear. Sullivan started begging her son to stay. She experienced a complete mental breakdown as a result of his refusal to stay. Uncontrollable sobs from the actress could be heard echoing throughout the entire house. Brooke, her daughter, recalled, even from my room the screaming was so horrible that I went into my bathroom and put my hands on my ears. There was unfortunately more to come. Before it improved, Sullivan's breakdown got significantly worse. The star was so severely wounded that she later hid beneath the bed and curled up into a ball, refusing to come out for a considerable time. She was eventually persuaded out by one of her friends using soothing tones, but it didn't work. Indeed, she was truly broken. In those hard moments, extreme measures were needed. Though it wasn't widely known at the time, she consented to go for rehabilitation for two and a half months at a psychiatric hospital. Undoubtedly, the actress's recovery from her illness was boosted by that experience. Tragically, her agony eventually took on a different shape. What was that? Sullivan kept a painful secret for many years. She was born with otosclerosis, a congenital hearing impairment, and as she aged, her hearing got worse. This was a terrible prognosis for an actress who is so reliant on sound. Her hearing impairment was too severe to ignore by 1957. Sullivan once more slipped into a profound depression. Sullivan's spark was dissolved dramatically after years of gradual fading. She was spotted in a Connecticut hotel room on New Year's Day 1960, fighting for life and barely conscious. Assistants hurried her to the hospital, but it was too late. She passed away at the age of only 50, before she even arrived at the hospital. 
After the world's surprise, troubling details began surfacing. When the results of the autopsy were released, it was reported that Sullivan had overdosed on barbiturates, leading many to believe that she had sadly killed herself after years of misery. Did she? Well, she didn't leave a letter, though, so the investigator determined that the terrible incident was an accident. We might never know the real story behind her last moments. Many people were impacted by Sullivan's passing, but Jimmy Stewart's reaction was the most heartbreaking. Stewart was deeply affected when he learned the truth. His wife later recalled, He kind of went into solitary mode for a while. He lost the passion that had always flashed inside him. It was certainly not the failure of his films, but the death of Margaret Sullivan that put a stop to his spark. He lost the woman who made him a star. Though they couldn't live like a couple, there was a beautiful bond between them. You know when you have a friend who matters a lot to you, who means more to you than any of your other relationships, and who starts to convert from someone you like being around to someone you can't live without. Can you relate to that feeling? That's exactly what James Stewart and Margaret Sullivan felt. Don't you think so? Share your thoughts in the comments. If you liked this video, don't forget to give it a thumbs up, subscribe if you are new here, and if you want to support my work, please visit my Patreon page. Margaret Sullivan's temper freaked out even one of the toughest and most powerful men in Hollywood. She was not alone with a unique personality. What made Betty Page innocent and perky at the same time? Watch this video.